In this interview, we talk about streaming video, scaling ease of use, and the challenges of collecting video analytics. This episode is sponsored by Rollbar. Setting up Rollbar could honestly be the quickest and most useful improvement you make to your application today. I know because I use it. Rollbar tracks errors in development and production as they happen. It's built by Ruby developers for Ruby developers, so it's really easy to add to your Rails apps. Using Heroku? No problem. Track all of your deploys with a single command you only have to run once. Go to try.rollbar.com syc for a free trial and set it up in five minutes, no matter the language. Try.rollbar.com slash SYC. Hey, fellow developers, this is Christoph, and you're watching the Scale Your Code show. How frustrating is it when you're trying to watch a video and it either doesn't load at all or it just keeps buffering? Well, whether you know it or not, streaming video is tough business, and I wanted to know exactly how it works. So I've asked Max Schnur to come on the show and share his secrets with us. Max is a lead engineer at Wistia, and even if Wistia doesn't sound familiar to you, chances are you've used it in the past. It's used by many to host and play videos. And I actually used it at Scale Your Code when I first started uh, back a few months back, so some of you may remember that as well. Anyway, Max, welcome to the show. Hi, Christoph, how's it going? Good, thanks. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. So the first question I want to ask you is, you know, if people haven't heard of Wistia and they usually go to YouTube to upload videos or something like that, they may not understand why there's a need for Wistia. What, what's your answer to that? What would you say to them? Sure. Um, well, the thing I usually tell people about YouTube and Wistia is that um, we're serving very different niches. We have very different reasons for existing. Like um, YouTube exists primarily to serve ads, right? That's how they make their money. That's why they exist. Um, and so they will, uh, they will make changes to their code so that they can make money off of that. Whereas we exist primarily to help um, marketers and individual websites, um, so we make decisions based on that. Um, what that means is there's no ads in Wistia videos. Um, we have uh, really kind of in-depth support. Um, and we focus on tools around video like stats and um, marketing type stuff that maybe YouTube wouldn't find any reason to prioritize. Sure, and you know the show's actually been around for about 10 months or so, and I think I was using Wistia for the first maybe maybe two, two, three months, and it was great. I actually, I really miss the data analytics I got from it. Really incredible analytics. I mean, I've switched to YouTube, and the, the reason I did that is simply because at first I thought about having private videos, so maybe having the interviews public for a while and then switching them to private or something like that. But then I decided to go against that. And that, that's one thing that Wistia is also fantastic about is you have that ability to make sure that it's being served from the right domain. Nobody else can embed your videos and things like that. So it, it has a lot of more granular um, uh, controls around it. But then uh, I decided, you know what, let's just make these videos public. That way it'll <laughs> be cheaper. And anyway, that's why I switched. But I do miss the, the analytics of it. And that's why I, I really want to deep dive into, first of all, how you stream these videos. And then second of all, how you get such rich analytics and put them back in the dashboard so that the content creators can look at them and see what's going on with their videos. Yep. So how did you get started with Wistia? Um, how did I get started with Wistia? Um, well, uh, right out of college, I majored in computer science. Um, I worked just kind of doing general web contracting um, for about three years. And then um, I had some friends up in Boston. <laughs> I decided to move to the area. And uh, they said Wistia was a good place to work. So uh, <laughs> that's, uh, it's funny. I just kind of showed up. Back then, there weren't very many people. There were no like official job interviews. I was just kind of there and then <laughs> had a job offer. <laughs> cool. <laughs> How long have you been there? Or when, when was that? Um, that was uh, March of 2011, so I've been here a little over four years now. Cool, okay. What does a day in your life at Wistia look like? What do you usually do from a day-to-day -day basis? Sure. Um, I'm kind of all over the place. Uh, it depends on the day. Um, I'd say some days I'm just heads down coding. Um, other days uh, I'm helping uh, teammates kind of 
figure out the code base, um, work through some tough problems. Um, I spend some time putting out fires, um, <laughs> and uh, I also like spend some time brainstorming changes to the product, things that I think could make a real big difference. Mm-hmm. So when I was looking at Wistia, I kind of discovered three different parts of your uh, of your applications, so to speak. First of all, you've got the Wistia app itself. Then you've got the the video content streaming part of the app, and then you've got the data analytics part, right? That's right. How do you, or what kind of scale are you running at? Like wh- it, it, whether you combine all of those or whether you separate them into different parts, how much video content are you delivering on a day-to-day basis? How many users, how many requests? How, what does that look like? Sure. Um, well, first for, for my own benefit, because uh, I always call these things by our internal names. Um, the Wistia app is the Wistia app. You got that one. Um, the stats processing. Um, sector we call the distillery, um, and the transcoding and serving layer we call the bakery. Okay. Um, so if I mess up and start calling them by that, you know what I'm talking <laughs> cool. about. Cool. Okay. Um, but uh, as for kind of some stats on volume, we do like um, we do about 1.5 million player loads per hour. Um, let's see what I have here. Uh, so player loads is that? Somebody clicks the play button and it starts. No, that, video? that's uh, just loading the page with the player. Oh, on I see. It. So I see. if you have three players on your page, that would be three player loads. Sure. Um, we do about uh, eighteen point eight million peak requests per hour to uh, our uh, Fastly CDN, um, and then we do about seven hundred forty thousand just like normal app requests per hour. Mm-hmm. Um, we. Transcode 12,500 videos per hour. Um, it's, it's, it gets pretty crazy. Um, um, as for plays, we get about 150,000 plays per hour. Um, and for the stats side of things, we get uh, 8 million stats pings uh, back per hour and about uh, 28,000 um, different media, just different videos per minute kind of pinging back. Awesome. Yeah, that's some serious t- stats going on, especially when you're streaming large files and got a lot of analytics coming back and you have to process and code all the videos. And we're definitely going to get into some of those more nitty gritty details. Are you still running on Rackspace? Uh, we are. Yeah, cool. we are right now. Although we do, we have had parts of our infrastructure on AWS kind of on and off. Why Rackspace? Um, well, we've been on there for a long time. Um, and it's funny, we actually started out on Slicehost um, back in the day when we had like, I don't know, like four servers and uh, Rackspace bought Slicehost and so that's how we originally became a Rackspace customer. Um, and since then we kind of frequently compare them against AWS. Uh, they have pretty similar offerings. Um, the big thing for us uh, with them is that um, they have pretty good support, um, which I, I know AWS, like they're not going to call you up if something goes wrong. and. And uh, well, I think you know, they do, but I think you have to pay quite a bit for that service. Yeah, you have to pay quite a bit. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, it, Rackspace is a little bit better for uh, for small fries, at least like we were when we started with them, yeah. where you can get better support. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. What parts of the app have you started moving to AWS, and why? Um, some of the stats processing database we, we've tried. I, I should say we're not like totally on AWS. Sure, okay. We're just kind of feeling things out. Um, but there are certain things like we use S3 as a backend, for instance, um, to store our files in long-term storage. Um, so it would be nice, for example, if uh, we were instead of sending our files across providers between Rackspace and Amazon, if we were just sending things within Amazon. Mm-hmm. Let's start with the video part of the application. And uh, before we do that, actually, I want to clarify when you say the Wistia app. What exactly is the Wistia <laughs> app? Uh, the Wistia app, I'll describe it as kind of like the hub of Wistia. When users actually log into Wistia um, and interact with the application, that's the Wistia app. Okay. Um, it's also kind of something that should be broken into several services because it's also our API origin. It's also the origin of uh, embeds and mm-hmm. our JavaScript. Um, so it does a lot of things that could probably be broken out a little bit further. Yeah, I was really curious to hear how you would uh, describe the scale at which you're running when you do have so many different parts of, of Wistia. I, I was really curious to see how you'd handle that question, but uh, really cool stats. 
So when, when thinking about, first of all, receiving the video, transcoding it, making sure you've got all the different bit rates, etc., and then serving it itself, what kinds of challenges do you run into? Sure. Um, well, there's a ton of things. Um, the thing that we've always kind of touted is um, balancing quality and de deliverability. So that has two sides to it, one that's encoding uh, derivatives. We call derivatives are okay. the new types of uh, videos from the originals. Um, encoding those at a quality that is suitable for playback and also deciding when to use that. Mm -hmm. um, there's also just a ton of um, I.O. that you have to deal with within the cluster that you might not think about. Like when you're getting, um, I don't know, like 30 uh, one gigabyte files uploaded to you at a time, and then you need to send those through within your cluster, there's a lot of moving files um, that has to happen, a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, other challenges, uh, there's a lot of volatility um, in demand for requests, um, also for uh, processing video. Mm -hmm. So, like I was saying, like you know, what happens if we get 200 one gigabyte uploads at a time? All of a sudden, <laughs> we have a lot to process right now. How do you handle that? How do you make sure you don't lose some of them? Yeah, um, we are able to bring on. Um, well, these boxes we call primes. They're the boxes that um, that receive files from uploads. Um, we have chef recipes, so we're able to just kind of bring up new ones. So we monitor how much uh, space is being used locally, and if uh, if we get close, it can spin up new ones. It's a manual job, but usually okay. we don't really come close to that right now. We just have really big file storage. <laughs> um, also, there's like differing levels of CDN support. Some they do a lot of different things. There's a lot of configuration there. Um, For the uploading part, uh, we did try that, but no. For the deliverability part, sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then over that, more on the client side, there's just like tons of differences between browsers and devices and operating mm -hmm. systems that you need to deal with if you want to have a uh, a system that delivers video broadly. Yeah, it sounds like a major, major pain just thinking about all the different devices you have to optimize for, the different browsers. Man, just trying to do some CSS for a, a basic site is a nightmare sometimes, so I can't yeah. imagine. Tell me about <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> You're the one who primarily worked on that at the beginning, right? Yeah, yeah, I started out at Wistia, um, and Brendan, the CTO, was like, yeah. so, you want to work on embeds? <laughs> I was like, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Going back to the video transcoding, did you build your own transcoding system, or did you use something that already pre-exists? Uh, we did. We, we have the system called the Bakery, which um, has actually existed since before his encoder, and those, I think it's existed since... Wistia started basically, um, and I think it came out with like one server that did one task at a time back when there were no customers, um, and it sort of scaled out from there. Where we have the primes, like I was mentioning, they receive files and serve files, mm -hmm. and then we have uh, a cluster of workers that processes tasks that creates derivative mm -hmm. files um, from those videos. Sure, sure. Uh, I, I can imagine that being quite CPU intensive as well. Probably got some beefy systems for those, right? Yeah, it's uh, it's intensive in pretty much everything in right. I/O and network yeah. <laughs> and sure. CPU. So yeah, uh, when we bring up a new worker, you know, can do. Right now, we have them doing two tasks at a time, um, and I forget the exact stats. Uh, they all have eight gigabytes of RAM, uh, <laughs> pretty crazy CPU, and you know, we run several several hundred. So that. Um, you know, we encode primarily primarily x264, which is great because it uh, is a fast encoding scheme. So um, if you look at the length of a video, usually we can do an encoding in about uh, half to a third of the time of the actual length. Wow. And that's all that includes like resizing it, having different bit rates. What else is into that process? Uh, <laughs> that, excuse me. That's mostly it. There's also a few different um, profiles for different devices. Mm -hmm. Like if you're encoding HLS for iPhones, um, that just has a different way of encoding. Um, we also double those encodes because we make flash derivatives that are also mm -hmm. X264, the X264 encoded. Okay. So how does that work? Let's say I upload a video. Do you queue that and then wait for a, uh, a transcoder server to be available, pass that through the transcoding, and then save it to S3? Or save it to something else. Uh, that's pretty uh, accurate. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, we're doing that. We don't send it to S3 right away. We actually just push it up to the primes in the cluster so sure. that uh, it can be served right away. And in the background, we kind of slowly, um, in a few hours, push it up to S3 for, mm -hmm. for long-term storage. Um, and we clear things out of the primes, too, to make space while that's happening. Okay, so now we have a nicely encoded video. How do we serve it to customers? How do we serve it? Um, well, we, when you're hitting a, a video in Wistia, <laughs> this could go really far. Uh, I'll, I'll go just with the video asset yeah. uh, for now. Um, they make a request to something like embed.wistia.com with some video URL. Um, they're actually hitting a CDN. The, that CDN could be one of a few, but it'll go back to origin, which is our primes. Um, our primes uh, run HA proxy with a special um, balancer behind HA proxy called um, bread routes. Bread routes? Yeah, bread routes. You know, they're in the bakery. Oh, um, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the bread routes kind of make a decision about where to send that request. Um, since we might have the file locally in the cluster, that would be the fastest way to serve it. Okay. Um, if it's there, we serve it directly off the file system using uh, Nginx. Um, and if it's not, we uh, proxy uh, S3 back to them. I see. Okay. How do you or how do your systems decide which which version of the video to, to stream depending on the user's bandwidth or whatever else you're calculating? Gotcha. That's um, that's primarily decided on the client side. So we we're actually pretty simple in this. We on on play, um, the user uh, will get some data back about the the bandwidth they have immediately after play, and we only make decisions about whether to switch to HD when you're actually full screen. So that gives us a chance to like not interrupt playback there. Um, but before then, um, when determining the first asset, we'll look at the device, we'll look at um, the size of the video embed, just kind of some heuristics to determine what the best asset is to play. Okay, so you'll load the player on a page. When the user clicks play, do you already have that information sent to you and you already know what to serve? Or is it when the user clicks play, then it sends all that information back and then displays the, the right one? So there's actually two things going on. One, the first video that you're actually playing, we decide that before you click play. Okay. Um, and then immediately after you click play, um, we actually do a bandwidth test to determine if you can uh, scale up to HD when you full screen. How do you do that bandwidth test? <laughs> Uh, we have a really rudimentary way of doing it. Um, when they click play, we we have this XHR image that we try to download while playing, and we bail out if there's any buffering or anything immediately. We just say you can't do it. Um, but we download this one megabyte image and determine your speed based on this. Um, that's actually a funny point. That image, uh, it's a picture of our our video guy's dog. And so everybody who watches a Wistia video has this picture on their computer, and they don't know about it. <laughs> What's his name again? Is it, is it Benny or something? I can't remember. Uh, yeah, Lenny. Lenny, Lenny. <laughs> That's funny. That's cool. I, <clears throat> I always wondered how you're able to determine that bandwidth like that. And it sounds pretty similar to the way that Netflix does it. I don't know if you saw or not, but I interviewed Jeremy Edberg from Netflix, and he was talking about how they're able to sort of cheat in a way because they do have access to the client side, and they can communicate back and forth with the servers and find which file is closest but also which server gives a, the lowest latency for that specific client. And that way they're able to best or to serve the best possible uh, speed and, and um, size of, of the video, et cetera, et cetera. So that's yeah. pretty interesting stuff. Yeah, that's a little bit more advanced than what we're doing now, but we right. do have plans to do that kind of stuff. Right. Um, and they do have their own CDNs as well. That, that must be nice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm sure you'd like that too, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine trying to open your own CDN around the world like that. That's mind blowing to me. Yeah, right. well, <laughs> we've we've <laughs> we've tried a few things before, but yeah, it's, it's nicer to have somebody else dealing with it. What kind of CDNs do you use? Do you use Fastly? Do you use uh, uh, um, what else do you use? So we use um, Fastly for our small assets, um, and we use we balance between um, Akamai, Edgecast, and Highwinds. Um, currently uh, for the actual video delivery. And that's really the secret sauce, right? I mean, if you didn't have CDNs, it just it would not be able to stream nearly as well as it does, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, on two sides. Uh, one, the video content wouldn't be as close to the user, and yeah. two, our origin would be absolutely hammered. <laughs> yeah, right. And when it comes to that kind of stuff, latency is king. I mean, the, 
you can have all the bandwidth in the world, but if the latency between the two um, nodes is bad, then you're going to be waiting forever for that video to load or play. Yeah, you know? and that's just a problem in general with yeah. streaming because, like I said, there's um, there's some things where we don't have that much control and we want to gain more control, you know? Yeah. So, uh, but re regional problems um, and problems with, like, local CDN nodes are some of the most frustrating things to deal with in this sure. area. There's a book called High Power Browser Networking by Ilya Grigoric. I'm not sure if you've read it or not, but it talks about these latency issues and how we've we've gotten so close to the speed of light for our fiber optics that unless we have more direct routes really we're not going to get any more speed or very little speed extra from that so that's the main challenge how do you keep reducing latency like even if you keep cranking up the bandwidth how do you keep uh, reducing latency and and for now the answer is cdn so yeah this very interesting book I, I highly recommend it if people are interested in this kind of thing all right back to videos what um what am i missing here We've got the bit rates, we're serving with CDNs. Are there any other optimizations that you guys have done to better serve videos? Or is that is that for the most part it? Um, there are probably a few small things. Um, one of the interesting things that I actually wrote a blog post on a while ago was um, kind of smart preloading on pages. Um, it turns out that Chrome and probably other browsers have limits on how many sockets can be open at a time. So let's say, ideally, you want to preload video so that when the user clicks play, it plays immediately, right? Um, if you do that with too many things on the page, suddenly you have maxed out your open sockets and nothing will play. Um, so we do some clever things with uh, post message within iframes, um, detecting how many uh, videos are on a page, you know, open audio stuff, and then only adding the preload attribute under certain circumstances, which helps a lot. How is that going to change, if at all, with HTTP2? Um, that's a really good question. Um, HTTP2, I expect to really simplify a lot of things. Yeah. Um, although, there's always going to be some kind of restriction on, you know, how much bandwidth you can do at a time. So, I expect it to still be useful. Um, you know, if you have 10 sockets open, that probably represents a lot of data flowing. So if you don't want that much data flowing, you still need to throttle it in some way. Um, yeah, I'm curious to see how, how that changes a lot of different things like minification, concatenation, all those different... Uh, I, I want to talk to someone about that in, in one of the future <laughs> interviews. That'll be really interesting. Yeah, I expect there to be kind of a, a melee immediately yeah. after it becomes the, uh, the main <laughs> go-to way until it kind of it settles down. Right, right. If you're looking for a reliable and easy solution to track your own errors and exceptions, I highly recommend Rollbar. Rollbar has already sponsored eight episodes of the show because that's how helpful they've been to developers like you who listen to the show. It doesn't matter how big or small your app is or what hosting provider you use, Rollbar only takes five minutes to integrate. Once integrated, Rollbar gives you real-time reports on errors your users run into. All of this gets reported in a clean dashboard where you can filter through local errors, development errors, or even production errors. Get a free account at try.rollbar.com slash SYC. That's try.rollbar.com slash SYC. You'll be really glad you did. Then after that, I think... I mean, I think we've covered quite a bit of, of the actual video part, but not monitoring, which right. I think is a, extremely important, right? Mm -hmm. Knowing how or when videos don't load, what, what caused it, how can you avoid it in the future? How do you guys detect that? Um, well, the primary way we do it now is we have a service we call Pipedream, um, which is kind of like our stats endpoint, except it's just for us. Um, and we use it... Um, within our app and within embed codes um, just to send data back basically all the time um, about what's happening. You know, if, uh, if the user clicks play, we get information about size of their window, where it was, um, you know, if it buffers, uh, that's if it's in a if it's in a playing state, but the time hasn't changed for a few seconds, so we know that it's buffering. Sure. Um, and we'll send that back. We also do uh, heartbeats. Um, immediately after play. Uh, the problem with that is um, originally we were trying to kind of track slow loads and 
you know, there's this implicit problem where um, we'll only know if a load is slow if the user waited around for it to actually finish, um, which if they have a really slow connection, they might just leave. So the heartbeats were our answer to that, basically. So instead of, um, you know, having this problem where things could never end, we send the heartbeats and we know if we have these heartbeats and we never received a play, then they probably just bailed. I see. Okay. So you send the heartbeats. I get it. Okay. So you send the heartbeats and then that's how you're able to determine if, if that ever started at all in the first yeah. place. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and of course the problem with this is if their internet connection is so sure. bad that they can't even do yeah. that, then we, you well, know, we're kind they, of in the dark. They probably have bigger problems if that's the case anyway, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd hope so. <laughs> sure. What else, what kind of analytics do you collect other than that? Um, well, the primary ad- analytics we collect for customers is, um, you know, plays, pauses, seeks, um, uh, conversions is really important for our customers. That's like, uh, when somebody enters an email and something we call turnstile, it's an email yeah. collector, um, or when they click a call to action um, or an annotation, that stuff is a uh, is a conversion which we show in heat maps, um, yeah. and we also uh, aggregate those heat maps into uh, graphs that show you your engagement. So that's like the areas of your video that are interesting, the, the areas that aren't the the areas that people rewatched a lot of times. You can see that in the graphs. That's the kind of data I just can't really get from YouTube. I mean, I've tried to look at different graphs and see how they could intersect together and try to form an opinion on that myself, but it's it's not the same. They don't really show you, hey, this user replayed that part of the video multiple times, whereas Wistia, you have like a, a bar which shows the length of the video, right? And inside that bar, in green is where the user watched it, and then it turns yellow to orange depending on how many times they replayed that certain part, right? Yeah, that's right. And that's extremely, extremely helpful, and I wish I could get that from YouTube. I hate <laughs> that I can't. <laughs> I just use Wistia, you know? <laughs> <laughs> sure. But so how do, you, how do you get that data back? How do you know when the user did replay back? Um, can, can you tell us more about that process? Sure. Um, when you're playing, we have, um, we call it a, a video tracker. It's just an object that binds to plays and pauses and seeks and... Um, it kind of collects those into a data structure, and once every, maybe every 20 seconds or 10 seconds, um, we ping back to the distillery. Um, that's that stat earlier about all the uh, pings we received to the distillery, um, and includes all those events that happened. And then it's the job of the distillery to kind of reconstruct those events into something that represents the heat map. Okay, okay. It, it, might, it, it blows my mind how you're able to do that, though, and it's like... Why isn't everybody doing that? <laughs> I mean, everybody isn't doing it because uh, it's pretty intensive. The distillery processes a ton of stuff. Uh, it has a huge database to facilitate that kind of stuff. What kind of database? Uh, it's a sharded MySQL right now. I think we have four or five very large shards. <laughs> okay. Do you use MySQL for pretty much everything, including the Wistia app itself and all the other parts of the application? Yeah, MySQL um, has been our bread and butter for a long time. Um, I think we're looking uh, at things like React for certain systems moving forward. Um, MySQL does make a lot of sense for us um, in some areas, like the distillery, where our data is very relational. Mm -hmm. Um, It's hard to change for certain reasons, um, but sharding it makes it so it's kind of manageable. What else do you have in your architecture? I know you talked about HAProxy for load balancing. You've got MySQL. Um, What what else processes things and, and makes things happen? Sure. Um, we're running HAProxy, Nginx, uh, Ruby on Rails is our primary like go-to programming language. Um, we run that behind unicorns mostly, although we do have some services that run Puma. Um, uh, we use NSQ for queuing. That's kind of our bread and butter. We, we wrote uh, the NSQ Ruby um, gem. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, what else do we have? Um, Redis is huge. We love Redis. What do you do with Redis? Um, pretty much all kinds of caching things. We use Sidekick for uh, async jobs, okay. so it's naturally a back end for that. Um, it's just super solid. Never goes down. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> what kind of stuff are you able to cache? Um, in the Wistia app, there's a lot of um, user data, which we don't consider like important enough to be persistent forever. Um, Uh, like stuff we stored in MySQL. So for example, if you uh, choose uh, a different kind of embed code, um, we store that preference in Redis. 
Okay. It's very small to do that. Um, and then there are other things we store in Redis, like um, if we're throttling IPs and stuff, we store some data about that. Um, okay. There's all kinds of things, though. Cool. What what kind of what kinds of um, do you use the same kind of monitoring system for your analytics itself? I know we touched on that earlier. Is it pretty much the same process that goes uh, making sure all these different services are working as as configured and, and properly? What else do you use to to track your different like MySQL for example or Nginx? Yeah, we use a lot of different things. Um, we so let me just see if I can go through our list. <laughs> we have uh, Scout which is our primary um, kind of systems level monitoring tool right now. Um, New Relic is on a lot of our boxes, but not all of them. Um, Honey Badger, we get uh, errors from that. Uh, what else? Track.js, um, we use in the Wisti app a little bit to get JavaScript errors. Um, a what app, sorry? Uh, in the Wistia app. Oh, OK, OK, sure. Um, but in the distillery, I think primarily we use Scout um, because the system level stats are the most important things for us, and we can write custom um, custom plugins for it to report on, for example, the NSQ um, uh, depth that's happening. So that's the buildup of stats we have that haven't okay. been processed. Um, and yeah, what do you use New Relic for? Uh, New Relic we have in the Wistia app that tracks um, kind of database performance. Um, request performance. Sure. Uh, look, it, it does a lot of things. Uh, we also use it for synthetic tests. Um, so uh, we, we run health checks back against certain points of our origin. Mm -hmm. um, and if those fail, we we send a message to PagerDuty and get paged about it. Yeah, that, that seems like uh, the go-to for a lot of different companies, having that uh, PagerDuty go ahead and ping people if, if something's going on. Yeah, we didn't have it for a long time, and it's been nice. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> So when uh, when we were going back and forth about this interview, you said or you mentioned scaling ease of use. What does that mean? Sure. Um, so scaling ease of use uh, at our company, we're pretty small. You know, we're like a sixty-person company, um, but we're also known for doing pretty in-depth support. Um, so it's hard to keep that going. You know, once you start scaling up your customer base. Um, and the highest touch points for us are kind of playback and embedding. That's the things that are most out of our hands. Um, so for our customers, you know, our choice is basically either they have trouble with these issues and we don't help them, or we have trouble. They have trouble with those issues and we help them, and it takes a lot of time. Yeah. Um, so the best answer we could have is just not to have support, right? To just make things really simple. Um, and so I usually talk about this in the context of embed codes um, because our embed codes have changed a lot over the years um, and they've always been kind of a focal point for support issues. Um, so for example, in 2009 or 2010, our embed codes looked pretty much like a, uh, an object slash embed, uh, you know, flash embed with hard-coded video assets and whatnot. And uh, they were pretty ugly, but it was simple for us to make. You know, it was just you know, what we were using. Um, and then after that, uh, you know, after we started getting more customers and it turned out that didn't work everywhere, uh, we experimented with some JavaScript things, with some iframe things. Um, and there's always these problems you don't expect that come up um, just by virtue of like integrating. So for example, WordPress does a lot of bad things to embed codes. Um, or even if you look at like a markdown parser, um, if you have new lines, Mm -hmm. in your code, uh, all of a sudden you have a break or something in the middle of your embed code, which is going to mess it up. Ouch. Um, so there's just all these things that can happen um, that we've learned over the years that uh, have made it so we, we had to simplify our embed codes in a certain way that behind the scenes um, is actually kind of more complex and advanced, but to customers looks more simple. Um, and I think simplicity is the key, basically. Um, you know, by keeping things simple um, and giving us control, we're able to um, kind of scale the ease of use for customers and therefore reduce support and therefore, you know, increase how much work we can actually do on it. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we have similar issues with, uh, with playback, um, where again, it's like kind of out of our control. Um, that's why uh, I'm really interested in implementing a kind of client side CDN balancing, which I think is uh, similar to what you were talking about with Netflix before, where you kind of try a bunch of different things and see what the lowest latency is and see. Um, 
see if you're having problems in one area, let's try a different area. Okay. What kind of advice can you give to people, even if they're not embedding video content, just embedding anything else in, in all kinds of different websites across the world? What kind of advice can you give them? I know you said simplicity is king, but is there anything else that they can be doing? Yeah. Um, my primary advice is to respect the website that you live on. Um, that means kind of keeping things fast, keeping things asynchronous, um, and also um, do things that are simple. So uh, I'll give an example here. A lot of times people need to configure in some way an embed code, um, and they'll think, oh, let me add some data attributes to the markup, or let me add some embedded JSON. That stuff gets stripped out by all kinds of things. The easiest thing that never gets stripped out is class attributes, which sounds weird. Your class attributes can look weird, but technically it's all valid. Yeah, right. And sometimes you look at these embeds, and they, they load a lot of stuff. I, ha I haven't looked at Wistia or you know, I haven't loaded a page and uh, opened up the inspector to look at what kinds of assets get loaded from Wistia, but what advice do you have for loading all these different assets and making sure they don't slow down the progress of the actual page itself? Um, I think async is the biggest thing. So, so we've actually had an interesting story here um, because for the longest time, uh, we don't really version our, our player scripts. We, we have EV1 as our main player library, and it's been EV1 for the last you know, three and a half years. <laughs> um, but we update it all the time, uh, which means that we can't give it uh, you know, a year-long client-side exploration. So for us, there's this balance um, of giving us control and um, caching basically, and async loading. Um, so the compromise we have is, you know, we cache for what we consider a, uh, a decent amount of time. I think it's like an hour these days. Um, and we always load async. Um, so if you can go async, then you're pretty much guaranteed, unless a million other things are loading, yeah. um, that you're not blocking other processes. Have you run into any security issues? Um, well, yeah, <laughs> of course. Um, we haven't had any major breaches, fortunately. Uh, knock on wood. Um, but yeah, we've had some interesting things, um, some of which are just kind of short-sighted things from the original product. Uh, the most, I think, obvious example is for a long time you were able to enter JavaScript in your description of medias, just like plain old JavaScript, and it would run on whoever's browser. It's just like an X XSS uh, feature <laughs> built in, um, nice. which, which we stopped doing <laughs> a few years ago. Um, uh, another thing that was kind of like that is uh, we had a feature um, called CNames, uh, so you could CNAME your domain to a Wistia domain. Okay. Um, the problem with that is it didn't really, if you CNAMed it, it didn't support HTTPS, um, and so uh, you, if you were, you'd be logging into this non-HTTPS domain. Um, we don't allow CNAMES anymore for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's also been some fun things before we re-architected with uh, people trying to brute force SSH into our servers um, and locking right. us out from that which was fun because we had to write a counter brute force script to kind of kick them out and get back in and then block <laughs> them. Um, but yeah, we think, we think all the time about ways people could uh, kind of hurt our system. Um, and uh, the scariest thing, though, are just probably the things we haven't thought of, to be honest. Yeah, and plus you have multiple fronts, not only just from the embedding side of, of, of things, but also in your services themselves. So it's like you're across all these different browsers and things you got to keep account for and sounds like it sounds intense it really yeah. does yeah one of the fun things uh which is kind of hard to explain but i find interesting is um back uh so we still kind of allow javascript in our embed codes so if you're making a call to action for example you can have um javascript in it and it will run like you would expect it to but uh it won't do it on the wistia.com domain which means it won't do it on our app and our embed codes used to have an origin of fast.wc.com, the, the iframe embed codes, um, and it won't work in those. We, we actually got an entirely new domain to facilitate JavaScript executing, which is fast.wc.net, nice. which is why our iframes have that now. Okay, I see. Cool, it's, it's always interesting to hear some of the, the security issues that other people have run into, and uh, hopefully one day it will help somebody else avoid making those mistakes. Just you know, it's one of those things where you have so much going on, it's very difficult to think about all the different details. Even if now it, it seems obvious, it's very easy to miss some of these details. So I can definitely understand it from that point of view. Another, th another interesting thing you do with your videos and embeds is create these video sitemaps, right? For search engines to be able to crawl the video itself. How does that work? 
Um, well, uh, funny you should ask. Um, the sitemaps feature, um, the sitemaps feature is kind of going away, or at least becoming less prominent. Um, Google recently kind of changed what they look for in SEO. Um, the new the new SEO thing is called uh, JSON LD, um, which is JSON linked data, which is really cool. It makes it much better. We actually just totally deprecated our SEO embed codes. Um, because now with what we call standard embed codes, um, we just inject that data dynamically into the page and it gets crawled and it shows up just like it would otherwise. Um, the sitemaps are nice uh, still if you have other kinds of data that like if you don't, uh, if you don't want to like go with our automatic thing which is generated from the media mm -hmm. title and description then uh, you can kind of set up your own SEO stuff and it's useful then. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning of the interview, I asked you some questions about what your day-to-day -day life at Wistia is like, but we didn't really talk about the development process of Wistia, which is something I always find interesting, hearing how different companies handle development. How do you guys do it? What's the process like? Um, well, I should say it's changed a lot uh, over the years, but um, right now we have larger projects um, that we call rallies, um, and each rally is kind of assigned a team. Um, and teams are about between two and four people right now. We have a pretty small engineering team. There's only okay. like 10 or 11 of us, basically. Um, and each of the teams kind of self-organizes. Uh, they're usually not hard deadlines, but there are some like business-driven, like we really want to get this out by right. here type things. Um, Development-wise, uh, well, deployment-wise, I should say, we kind of deploy whenever we want. Uh, there's no... Uh, there's no rules about it besides don't deploy when somebody else is deploying. Um, uh, usually people call it out. We just built some uh, some disco lights that go off when people deploy too to let it let everybody know. <laughs> um, but yeah. What does your deployment process look like? Uh, we have a tool called uh, Skycrank. So usually people um, SSH onto this box um, and run a command like crank Wistia deploy and then they wait a couple minutes and their code is deployed. Um, so that's a custom tool. It's kind of built it's a combination of uh, Chef, which we use to scale up servers, mm -hmm. um, Knife SSH, and uh, yeah, we just send commands to the servers. They're fixed. They run updates from GitHub, etc. So usually if, if somebody wants to deploy code, they'll push their code to master on GitHub and then deploy and that's it, pretty much it. Does it run through some kind of uh, continuous integration or anything like that? Do you have any tests in place that you yeah, uh, when you push up a new branch or uh, any really any code to any yeah. branch, uh, we use uh, Solano, and it'll automatically run some tests on that. Um, yeah. Awesome. So what else have we not talked about? Is there anything else that you wanted to mention in the interview that I haven't touched on yet? I think I've pretty much covered every part. I mean, I'm sure we could keep talking about this for days, but <laughs> <laughs> this is, these are complicated uh, topics. But I think I think we've covered quite a bit. Uh, let me see. Yeah, I think that's most of it. Cool, awesome. Oh, w can you share some of the the, uh, the projects you're working on right now, or is that top secret? Uh, I wouldn't say it's top secret. It's, that's some of the interesting stuff, actually. Yeah, I should have brought that up. Um, one of the coolest things that uh, I'm planning on starting pretty soon is something we're calling the upload server. Um, and that's something that's going to allow us to do a lot of cool stuff around upload. So, for example, right now, when you upload to Wistia, and I think probably most other services, uh, the file needs to get into the service before you can start transcoding and start doing things with it. The upload server, we plan to kind of make it so you can do things like upload, uh, so you can transcode while uploading. So for example, we might be able to even to play back the video before it's all the way uploaded to our system. Um, be able to get the still almost immediately, um, embed almost immediately. Um, you know, If you can start an upload and embed it, you know, we think that's a really great, cool thing. How do you do that? <laughs> uh, well, it's not done yet, but uh, the idea is that we'll have this server that um, will take the data and be able to serve it in chunks to our workers who we can then kind of... Um, you know, FFmpeg is pretty good about being able to do like uh, range requests, so it can make range requests to these servers and it can serve the data that it has and it can do partial encodes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot of re-architecting involved, but I think it's worth it. Yeah. I was reading the other day about the different adaptive bitrates techniques used, and 
I think this was kind of dated uh, information, so I'm not sure if this is really current for today, but talking about YouTube, how let's say you load a video, for example, and you it may start out really blurry, but then it starts uh, switching to higher def because it's got these different chunks of time and it's stored in all these different, um, like you, you might have, I don't know, five to 10 seconds of a certain quality and it could automatically switch it. That kind of reminds me of what you're talking about. Yeah. A little side tangent there, but... Yeah, well, that, that type of adaptive bitray stuff is yeah. we're actually making a new player right now too that is going to be doing that very thing. So awesome! It should be useful. <laughs> yeah, should be seeing some some awesome updates in the future. Then. Yep. How long do you think that's going to take? <laughs> oh man! What, you I want to speak for my that. teammates here. <laughs> what, what, what you're ta- uh, working on with the uh, uploading? Oh, that that I think is on the order of you know a few months, half a year, something yep. like that. Yeah, it's, it's part of a larger initiative for that kind of. Uh, integration and upload stuff awesome i really look forward to it i'll keep an eye on it and see how things change i mean you can usually notice noticeably see these changes if you're actively looking for them so i'll be looking uh at that in the next few months and and excited to see what kind of changes you have in the future if people want to want to connect with you or uh chat with you how do you recommend they do that uh sure i'm on twitter sometimes uh as uh max schner it's just my name um, and that's uh, S C H N U R, right? You got it. Cool. And did you say you had a blog? You mentioned writing a blog post. Oh, I don't think uh, I ran across it. <laughs> if, there might be some things on wc.com slash okay. blog. It's kind of re architecting, but if you search for my name on it, you'll find that and probably a blog post on uh, how I come, came up on programming uh, with Baldur's Gate back in high school. <laughs> Which I I'm, recommend highly. <laughs> I know your CTO also has written a few things on his personal blog. There's a few posts that are talking about the architecture of Wistia and some of the changes, like fixing or cleaning up old URLs that don't point to anything anymore. So that's kind of interesting too. I'll, if I remember, I'll try to link that up below the video so that uh, people can follow up and, and read more information if they're interested. But hey, Max, I really appreciate your time. This was a fantastic interview. How do you feel about it? I feel great. That was fun. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, sometimes I know that after the interview, you think of something that you should have said. You're like, oh, man, why didn't I mention that? I'm, uh, I'm sure there's something, but I, I'm sure. good with what we talked about. <laughs> That's good to hear. Thank you, Max. People, please leave a comment. Thank him for his time. Uh, very generous to, to do this with us today and share his uh, knowledge and information. So thank you all for watching, and thank you, Max. Appreciate it. Thanks. Yep, have a great day, guys.